Okay, so let's talk about base excision repairs, okay, or BERs, base excision repairs. So in a base excision repair, essentially what we're doing is um, we're working with a single strand of DNA, so it's a single strand repair mechanism, okay, so we call that a single strand repair mechanism. And essentially, um, so for example, let's just, uh, here, let's draw out a, okay, so imagine this is our DNA, we'll just take another one. So going back over here, we have a, a five prime to a three prime end, and again, so uh, then we end up having another one, and we go from a three prime to a five prime end, okay? so. What ends up happening is again we have damage to a single base. Okay, so as remember these are all made up of individual bases, right? So A, T, G, C. So remember again what do we have for the bases? Uh, quick overview in case you've forgotten. We got A, T, G, and C. Right. So when a damage and these, this is essentially what all these little lines represent. Okay, these red lines, they all represent a single, um, a, new, a, single um, a single base. So when we end up having damage to any single one of these, right, then this is where a base excision repair comes in. So in a single base, uh, in a, with a base excision repair in this mechanism, um, ATGC, this is what's going to end up being repaired. One of these will end up getting repaired. Sometimes maybe two or three, but usually it's less than five. And, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, you can have these long runs or, um, uh, again, this is, uh, this is not a, a long run. But, um, uh, yeah, so as we go through with this, what ends up happening is that usually through some processes, for example, now, how do they get damaged? Again, we talked about this before, and you guys can look in the in the PowerPoint. So, the most common the most common way that uh, we end up getting damaged here on single base is through uh, hydrolytic deamination. So, this is the number one cause for it: hydrolytic deamination. Right? This is going to be the number one cause for um, for damage to a single base over here. Right? So, this is it. This is the main one. Aside from that, you know, there can also be another another cause could be oxidation. Okay, so this is another another way that uh, it could be uh, damaged, right? Through oxidation. And aside from oxidation, uh, also through alkylation. So, all right. So these three these are three ways that. Um, Three of the most common ways, but again, the, the number one cause usually ends up being hydrolytic uh, deamination. All right, now for a base excision repair to work, right, or BRRR, okay, this is what we have over here, BRRR, this is the acronym that's used. Uh, we need lots of enzymes, right, for it to work. And what are the most common enzymes for this are going to be the following, okay? So let's talk about the enzymes. All right, so as for the enzymes, there is a, the first one is DNA glycosylase, all right, and DNA, glyco uh, DNA glycosylase, this ends up removing the damaged base. Okay, that's the job for, the, for DNA, gly 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 DNA glycosylase. The next one is AP endonuclease. Okay, AP endonuclease. And this recognizes the, the AP site. And the AC, the AP site, this is where, this is the, the site where the base is missing. This is the missing base site. Okay, this is the AP endonuclease. This is where the enzyme works. Okay, AP endonuclease, it recognizes the AP site. And then it creates a nick in the, in the, the phosphodiester backbone. Okay, so that's what it'll do. Recognize that AP site, and then it makes a nick in the, the phosphodiester backbone. The next one is polymerase, okay? Right, so again, what does polymerase do? It, it's, 
gonna end up inserting the base that's missing, inserting the base. Then what's the last one? The last one is DNA ligase. Okay, and if you remember ligase, it just ends up sealing uh, the nick. Now there's another one, it's called, uh, uh, the other one is, it's fen, fen1. So this is, it's a flap endonuclease and you know it ends up removing the five prime during these again when we end up having more than one so we call these these the long runs so uh, this long uh, long patch base excisions when you end up having this long patch I'm sorry it's not long run but it's long patch a long patch base excision so in the long patch uh, base excision we end up um, this protein also comes in and this enzyme comes in and uh, playing a role and so when you have more than two or three um, bases that need to be removed, this is when FEN1 will come in. Okay, so remember, this is a, it's a flap, flap endonuclease. Okay, so this is the, the basics for uh, BRRRR. Now let's go and see how these mechanisms work. All right, so let's take all these enzymes we talk about it and look at what needs to happen in order for a repair to, to take place, again, for these uh, base excision repairs or the burrs. So essentially what ends up happening is this. Look, we end up having a DNA molecule, right? Here's a, a, dou or, or a double-stranded DNA. Oh, hold on. This should not be over here. So this should be, let's see, a, so this should be a... A C, okay, because this is a normal DNA. So this is our normal DNA, okay? So now what ends up happening is, again, through a process, I don't know, for example, let me just use this here. Um, for example, through, let's go with hydrolytic deamination, right? So through hydrolytic deamination, um, deamination, through hydrolytic deamination, we're going to end up getting a point mutation, okay? And this is what that looks like. Okay, this is that point mutation that we have over here. So this part over here, this is where the mutation occurred. So what did we have before? If you look over here, uh, this is one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. This is the fifth base. So if you count over here, one, two, three, four, five. This is it right over here again. Okay, so this is in the normal, um, the normal sequence, the normal DNA, and the, the, the fifth base should have been a cytosine. And now what do we end up having through hydrolytic deamination? That ends up getting mutated to a uracil. So again, this is this point mutation that occurred. So now the problem is this. Um, this genetic code has changed, right? So what's going to end up happening is when a DNA is trying to copy itself, you're going to end up getting a wrong base that gets put in here. And then essentially, we end up having a completely, potentially completely useless protein if this does not get fixed. So remember, each one of these, remember if we read each three um, bases, it ends up coding for a specific amino acid, right? So each three bases codes for a specific amino acid. So now if we have this AUT, for so here, if you go over here, this is one amino acid, this is another amino acid, this is another amino acid, and on and on and on, okay? So, um, if we were to take this, now what's gonna end up happening? And if we were to transcribe this, right, or if we were to copy this, this would be, the A would be a T, this would also be an A, but what about this, this U? U will turn into what? This will turn into, this will be a C. So, in this case, we end up having a, a mismatch. I'm sorry, not, not a C. This will be a, let me erase this. Um, this would be a A, okay? I was looking over down over here where the G is. That's how I, and why I said C. But anyways, um, yeah, we would end up getting a, an A over here. So what's the problem over here? Well, this is the wrong code, right? Now we can't get what we're supposed to get. We're gonna get we will get a completely different uh, amino acid over here whatever TAA codes for. So we can't have that, we need to fix this. So uh, this is where the problem lies. 
So the next thing that happens, so remember, this is the first thing that ended up happening over here, is that we ended up having this point mutation. Now the second part is, we come over here, this enzyme DNA uh, glycosylase ends up coming, okay? DNA, uh, DNA glycosylase, it removes, it's gonna remove this uracil, okay? this U that you see in red. Uh, it's gonna remove the, the, the uracil, uh, it cleaves the, the N-glycosylic bond, and then it initiates the base excision. So again, the, the base, it ends up getting removed from the DNA. And this is what we see over here, okay? So there, now it's removed. As you can see, it's no longer here. So this is what DNA gly glycosylase did, okay? DNA gly gly glycosylase came in and removed that uracil, all right? Now, the third step, so um, let's put this down, step number, well, anyways, we'll go back to that later. Now what's going to, <clears throat> what ends up happening is this. All right, now we have another AP endonuclease. AP endonuclease will come in, all right? AP endonuclease, it recognizes that AP site, all right? And then it cleaves the AP site to the three prime hydroxyl adjacent to that, um, the, the five prime deoxyribophosphate. So, Let's go over here, and this is exactly what we see over here, all right? Remember what we had over here? We had a missing DNA glycosylase. It came in, and, and it, it took away the bad base, right? It took away the U. Now that that U is gone, what's going to end up happening is the AP endonuclease, it comes in, and it's going to end up uh, cleaving this, this, this segment, okay? It ends up uh, cleaving the... the uh, the AP site, okay? So now we end up having this this uh, this gap that's present, right? Oh, God. Uh, all right. So now once that's happened, the next part that ends up happening is we end up having, yeah, so we have this, uh, we have the excision that takes place. Now, lastly, we have one more step. Okay, and this is the final step. In this step, we end up having DNA polymerase. And we end up having DNA ligase. All right, so what does polymerase do? Polymerase, it ends up, it inserts that missing base. So as you can see, this is our missing base over here, right? This is what, what was gone, so if you look over here, we had A, T, T, A, and then we had the gap. So, there, A, T, T, A, and then we put the C over here. Okay, so that's what DNA polymerase did. Now, this little gap that we had over here between the, in the, in the breaks in the line, DNA ligase came and fixed that. Okay, so that's a nick that we're talking about. Ligase will come and fix that nick that's, that's there. All right, so this is, the, the, this is what ends up happening. This is what DNA ligase does. And this is it, this is base excision repair. Okay, so hopefully you understand this. If not, just kind of look at this one more time. So this is a very brief overview. Uh, we'll kind of go over this. So remember, in our first step again, we start off with our normal DNA over here. And through some event, okay, in this case we use hydrolytic deamination, we end up getting a mutation, a point mutation. And that point mutation is the uracil that ends up uh, being placed inside of a cytosine. So, in our first step, what ends up happening is, step one, here, let me just use red now. Step one, DNA glycosylase, it comes in and it ends up removing that base, okay? Step two, AP endonuclease, it comes in, it excises, it makes the excision, okay? And then step three, polymerase comes in, it inserts the correct base and ligase ends up sealing the nick. So in very simplistically, one, two, and three steps, uh, this is the, the, the big, picture in uh, for base excision repair. So maybe you want to review this one more time with the, uh, with the, uh, the gaps or the, the, the details so you can understand this better. Okay, so we're going to be reviewing over the nucleotide excision repair, uh, NER. So the very first step for nucleotide excision repair is uh, 
the ability to recognize the DNA damage. So step number one is DNA damage recognition. Okay, so this is our very first step that we need to address. So you have to understand there's lots uh, in, in eukaryotes, there are a lot of factors and uh, it's a rather complex, it's a, a series of events that needs to happen. Compared to prokaryotes, it's extremely efficient. Uh, it's just a handful of steps and not a lot of uh, components that are involved in it. So again, remember, this is in, in eukaryotic cells. So again, we are eukaryotic organisms. So we're looking at uh, uh, how uh, the nucleotide excision repair occurs in, in humans, in this case. So the first thing, as I said, is going to be uh, the, the DNA damage recognition. So Let's make our, now these uh, damages that occur, okay, or these distortions that we'll have, they could occur in two forms, okay? So we can have a major distortion or we could have a minor distortion. So in a, a major distortion, we're saying we have more than one uh, lesion that, that may be present, maybe three or five lesions, um, lesions that, that may be present. So, uh, and remember a lesion, this is the areas that are faulty. So if we make our, um, you know, if we make a DNA molecule over here, so for example, okay, let's go like this. So this we have our five prime end over here, and we have our three prime end over here, and we have our the the complementary strand, um, and so here we'll have. And so we have our three prime end over here, and then we have the five prime end over here. So essentially what we're saying is, oh, now to describe the lesions, I'm just gonna use here, fine, I'll just go with red. So if we have these areas over here, let's put these little triangles. So if we have these little triangles over here, over there, over here, this is our, our lesions, this is the areas that are, that are bad, <clears throat> okay? So what we're saying is that, um, it, it, because there's three of them, we're gonna say that this is a, what we call a major, a major distortion. Okay, this is what this would be called, referred to as a major distortion. Okay, now the opposite would be a minor distortion. And minor distortion essentially you have only two areas that, or one area, for example, uh, that's uh, that's being affected. So remember, in, in major distortion, there's multiple. There's three, four, five, six, seven, uh, lots of them. Uh, so I'm gonna make another picture. Now remember, the, the DNA over here, it's gonna be wrapped around in with the histone protein, right? So remember, what do we call that? When you have the, the chromatin, your uh, DNA strand that's wrapped around that, we, that term is nucleosome. So let me just, uh, here, I'll use um, purple to define this uh, histone protein. So imagine this is a histone protein. So remember, the DNA is wrapped around this, histone protein, so you'd have no one histone protein there, so you got histone proteins all over, right, because this is how they, they wrap around them. Um, okay, so remember, these are our histone proteins that we have over here. So, um, okay, very good. So now, um, one thing I want to do is, hold on, let me do one thing before. I want to remove this. So I want to copy this and, and reuse this for something else. Uh, when I use my, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to make a minor one as well. So let me do this. Let me go ahead and snip this out. Um, there we go. Okay, so now I can take this and copy this and uh, Yeah, I'll paste it over here, paste image, there we go. So, at the same time, let me shrink this down as well. Can I shrink this down? I can't, okay, here, so let me just w work with this for now. Uh, all right, so, here, so remember we said this is our major, and I'm gonna copy one more, and I'm gonna paste this here as well. So now this is, let's call this our minor, okay? So. Uh, maybe you guys understand what I'm doing over here now. So essentially, remember, what, we, what did we say that we're doing? We have 
there we go so let's call this our major over here on the left this is our major distortion and then remember this will be our minor one over here minor distortion and remember what we said in a major distortion you're saying that essentially there's more than one right so for example there's one over here we have a lesion over here maybe there's another lesion over here perhaps there's another one over here okay so you have multiple now in minor distortion eh, there's only one so imagine just you have one lesion over here that's it okay so this is the difference between the minor and major um, distortion so remember we have the there are both the, the DNAs they're wrapped around these histone complexes and remember, when, when we have that, we, we call that a nucleosome. So now that we have that, now how are we going to recognize these um, these areas that we have over here? Okay, how do we know where the bad part is? How do we recognize this, this, that? What has to happen for that? So this is what uh, this first step involves. Okay, it's uh, the recognition of this uh, the, these lesions. So when you for the major distortions, we have the protein which is called the the X P C protein okay and this is what's gonna recognize the lesion okay okay it's gonna recognize the, the, the lesion the XPC protein remember this is for the major distortion um, now aside from that uh, we need a handful of other proteins that are involved uh, because you know not only do we recognizes but then also we have to free we have to liberate the the dna from the histone complex we have to you know we have to break apart the nucleosome uh, we have to dissolve that nucleosome so for the major distortion yes the first thing is the xpc it's going to combine but in addition to that in order to unwrap that nucleosome we need a couple of more uh, pr proteins and they are we have the we have a, the h HRAD 23B and there's also the scent 2 proteins so both of these are going to end up uh, they're going to unwrap the nucleosome okay so essentially what ends up happening then when these guys come into play is that at that point H22 so for, let's just say with this one so they're going to end up I cannot erase that because so here let me go over here so HRED and SENT2 essentially they'll end up taking away this histone complex so now we have this that's three okay no more histone complex that's there so this is what the HRED 23B and the scent 2 end up doing. Okay, all right. Now, in now remember this is for the major distortion. Now, in the minor distortion, it's a little bit different. All right, we don't have the, the same players. So there's different players that are involved. In the major, in, in the the minor distortion, the proteins that uh, that will recognize are it's not XPC. Okay, so remember for the major distortion, it's XPC. In minor distortion, it's another protein that's called D, D, B, two. Okay, and this DDB, DDB two is also known as some people they also call it XPE. So XPE or DDB two. So you can use this interchangeably. So this is what's going to recognize the lesion. Okay, first this is what initially recognizes the lesion. After that, then the XPC will come into play, right? So once DDB2 recognizes it, then XPC comes in, moves in, then at that point what ends up happening is the DDB2, okay, step number three, DDB2 will then, uh, it will degrade the nucleosome, okay? So at that point, it's gonna end up degrading the nucleosome. So uh, you don't need as many proteins in a minor, uh, for the minor distortion. So again, you just have uh, XPC and DDB2 that end up uh, end up uh, recognizing and then uh, liberating the DNA from the, the histone uh, protein. 
for the minor distortion, all right? So this is the first step in the nucleotide excision repair. This is what happens. Now, we'll move on to the second step. All right, so now that we have recognized the damaged DNA, what do we do? So the second step is, the second step is gonna be the, where is this, okay. Um, let me switch that color out so we stay consistent. So that's gonna be DNA opening. DNA opening and damage verification, okay? okay? DNA opening and damage verification. This is, the, this is our, our, our second part uh, of this uh, of the series. So what, what needs to happen is that uh, in order for this to occur, we need to have um, what are the, they're called the, uh, the transcription. Oh, oh, by the way, so before I go over there, between the major and minor distortion, all right? The only difference between the two is recognition. Okay, so after this point, once we recognize, then all the other steps, they're the same. They're pretty much essentially, they're all the same. Okay, so with that said, DNA opening and damage ver verification. So what's gonna happen over here is that we need what, what are called the transcription factor two uh, H uh, proteins, okay? So this is the transcription factor two H protein. And this is essentially, it's made up of a, a group of, um, it has a three groups of components that it's, it's, it's made up of, okay? So the first of these groups are what's called the, the core group, okay? The core group. And the core group essentially is made up of the following. We have, um, there's XP, XPG, and XPG is a AT, it has ATPase activity, okay? So XPG, then there's P52, there's also P34, uh, there's P, P44, P62, and also there's one more, P, P8, okay? So this is a, the number eight, P8. All right, right here, let me, there we go. So uh, th this is what ends up making uh, the, these, uh, the core group of proteins, okay? There we are, P8. Now, uh, the next group, group B, would be the, these are your cycling CDKs, okay? Your cycling dependent kinases. And essentially there's, there's cyclin one, cyclin H, and then MAT1 also, you don't have to worry too much about this for now. Uh, but know that, you know, there's the core groups, and you know, I mentioned what these are, then there's the CDKs, and then there also, uh, for the last group, we have the last part, we have the X, P, X, P, D, okay? And X, P, D, this is, this is the, the protein that's, the actual, that's gonna do the actual damage verification, okay? X, P, D will do the actual damage verification. X, P, D is also the, it has a helicase, helicase activity in addition to it being an ATPase. So, uh, all right, let's, uh, let's look at what, what the, the steps, what, uh, how all this uh, unfolds. Um, so, can we use this? Let's see if we can use this, can we scale this? Okay, so let's go over the steps that are, are gonna take place in D the DNA opening and the verification. So remember, in the first part, all we had was we had the nucleosome, which was liberated, right? So we got rid of the, the, the histone complex, the histone protein. So now, remember, DNA, it's made up of, we have two strands, right? You have one strand over here, the green one, which goes from the five prime to the three prime direction, and then the blue one that goes from the three prime to the five prime direction. And remember, in between them, we have, I made these lines here, these blue lines that go across, um, where the, the the bases which are connected to one another by the hydrogen bonds. So remember, these bonds, they need to be broken in order for the excision to take place. So uh, this is what we're talking about over here. 
uh, in DNA opening, we're going to be removing these hydrogen bonds. So it, it, we're going to have, um, in, in, in essence, we're going to end up having a, a bubble that ends up getting uh, created, okay, the DNA bubble. And that's usually about 30 bases, um, 30 bases long. Uh, and then, of course, then we're also going to have the second part with this DNA, the, the damage verification. So we talked about the proteins that are involved. We talked about the TF2H, and then we talked about the core, uh, the core group, the CDK, and the XBD. So now, uh, to streamline this along, I ended up taking the liberty of drawing this out, or I just kind of made this a little bit bigger. So remember, this red part over here, this triangle, this represents the lesion that's present, right? This is the part that's, that, that's bad. So the first step is this. In the first step of this, we're going to have the, let's write it down over here. We have our X, P, B. It's going to bind. Okay? And then it recruits the TF2H component. Now, in order for XPD, let's draw it out over here. So let's imagine, let me, I'll do, use purple for this. Okay. So imagine if this is XPB over here. Okay, now, in order for XPB to, to bind, XPB needs um, P52. So P52, okay, P52 will end up forming a complex. Um, okay, so P52 is going to end up coming. And eventually, so let's imagine this is here. This is P52. And what's going to end up happening is here, P52 will come in. It binds with, um, it will bind with, no, this is our XPB. Okay? So once P52 binds with XPB, then XPB will come and it will bind to the, um, to the DNA. All right? So here, let me just kind of draw this out over here there we go so it's going to come and bind over here now all right now that we have this um this is going to end up pulling in once xpb binds now what ends up happening is xpb it allows for all of the these uh these core groups which i had mentioned before to come and bind on top of them okay so now it has uh, the, the positions the the binding regions xpb for P34, P44, P62, P8, etc., etc. Okay, so this is the purpose for that. So that's this is the very first step that will happen. Okay, is that we end up having the XPB, which first binds with P52, and then it will go and then bind to the DNA, which uh, at that point allows for the other uh, TFT trans transcription factor 2H components to come into play. Now the second step is that um, in the second step. We have XPD, okay? XPD, we need that, okay? This is required um, after XPB, XPB binds, okay? So uh, now X, this is what XP, XPB, XPD does a couple of things, all right? So let's draw XPD out first here. Uh, let's just use here, we'll use this for XPD. All right, so this is our XPD over here, XPD. Now, in order for XPD to work, XPD needs P44, okay? So P44 will go bind to XPD, and then XPD can then go and bind and then start the process. So XPD, uh, XPD, it has two, all right, so there, it's made up of two do domains. XPD is made up of a iron sulfur domain, and it's also made up of a... Uh, what's called the an arc domain, okay? So an arc domain and this iron sulfur domain, and both of these it ends up forming like a tunnel, right? So what ends up happening is this: um, the shape of this again. So as I said, it forms like a tunnel, and as the as XPD, it's is um, it's translocating along the the strand, the DNA strand. Uh, it's going to get to a point where, you know, where you end up having this, this damage over here, okay, this part. And guess what? This part's not going to fit through that tunnel. So then it stops over here, okay?
Okay, so when it stops at this point, then the helicase property in um, XPD, then it will end up breaking and start, well, it will start to, be, it will become activated and then it's gonna open up this DNA, right? So this is how XPD ends up uh, opening the, the DNA for, uh, yeah, so it ends up opening it up. And also at the same time, the XPD, it's gonna end up verifying, okay? So it verifies the, so it ends up working both ways, okay? So as it's translocating along, it comes up to this, to that, that bulge, okay? This, this part over here, it's like, aha, so this is the, that's a verification part. Now, once it verifies that, then it ends up opening up the the uh, the DNA with the again. That's the helicase property of it. So this essentially is the the second part for the nucleotide excision repair. So now we have our XPB and XPD formed. We've opened up this. Uh, we've verified. The, the damage on the DNA, and we've opened up the DNA. Now let's move on to the third step. Okay, so the third step is, is the assembly uh, of uh, some of the pre-incision complex. Okay. So it's the assumption of the pre-incision complex. Now, in order for this to take place, again, more proteins are required. And the proteins that are required over here are XPA, uh, RPA, RP, hold on. Oops. All right. Uh, there we go. Okay, so XPA is one of them, and RPA is another, and the other one is going to be XPG. Okay, so these are the, the proteins that we need. The first one, again, being XPA, RPA, and XPG. So what's going to end up happening here is this. All right, so here we go. Now remember, in, at the end of the, the last step, okay, when XPD uh, binded with P44, the the end result essentially was that we ended up having this this fork that was created. And again, this is uh, this is called a this fork over here, or this bubble that you see that's created. It's called a thirty nucleotide bubble. Why? Because it's about thirty nucleotides uh, wide. So uh, this is what ended up happening in the the previous stage. All right. So now now that we have this bubble, what's going to end up happening is that we end up first having this protein. Um, let's use this color over here. Okay, it's called the, okay, it's going to be this protein over here, okay, the RPA protein. So RPA comes and binds to this bubble. Okay, now remember, we have two strands, the 5 prime to 3 prime, and then the 3 to 5. Now, one thing I forgot to draw over here is, remember, we said that the the lesion was over here. So in one of the, 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 um, the strands, we have a defect and the other strand is good. So RPA comes and binds to the good strand, okay? The, the, the part that does not have a defect. Now, so RPA comes and binds over here. Now, the next thing that happens is this. We end up having XPA that comes, okay? This is the next protein is XPA, okay? So now XPA, let's use a different color to symbolize that. And here, we'll just use this. So XPA is going to come and it ends up coming binding over here, all right? So this is our XPA. Now, when XPA comes, all right, XPA is the actual, it's the, it's the recruiting protein for XPF. Let me write that out. It's a recruiting protein for XPF and also for for um, ERCC1, okay? All right, then what ends up happening is XPF and ERCC1, they end up coming and binding. So here, let's make a, here, let's do this. This is our 
X, XPF, and then we're gonna use, I don't know here, for ERCC1, okay? So now, there we go. ERCC1 has come and attached, and then also we said XPF will come and be recruited also by the XPA. All right, so now we, we have this, they're both uh, at the position where they need to be. So once this takes place, right, um, actually before this happens, we end up having another, so okay, let me tell, let me, so as you can see over here, essentially this will end up, um, so this is this pre, yeah, this pre-incision, okay, so th this ends up getting formed over here. Um, all right, now, the next thing that we're gonna end up happening is we have one more protein. So we so far we said XPA, RPA, and then we have one more. The, the uh, This one is gonna be XPG. All right, so XPG, let's make, let's pick a different color for XPG. And um, I guess we can go with orange, right? Or it's just similar, anyways, here, there we go. There we go. This is gonna be our XPG. All right, so this is a endonuclease enzyme and it will cleave, so this is what ends up happening. XPG, okay, when it connects, it starts to cleave towards the three prime end, okay? And XP, uh, XPA, it will start to cleave towards the, the five prime end, okay? So it starts making, the XPA will start to make cuts towards the five prime end and XPG will start to make cuts towards the, the three prime end, okay? So remember, Two proteins, one uh, the DNA, the the, the strand it has a one a, one side that's close to the five prime end it has a, a five prime. It goes in a five to three prime direction, right? So again, this XPA it cuts towards the the five prime end. So when it does that, okay, when it starts to cut towards the five prime end, what ends up happening? We end up getting the three part hydrox uh, hydroxyl end that ends up getting liberated. That starts to stick out. Okay, and this is what this represents over here. And you'll see this, we'll talk about this in a minute and you'll understand why I ended up drawing this part over here. Okay, so uh, as far as XPG goes, I told you uh, about that. Now once, let's keep going with this. Now once the, so what, let's see, what did we do about here? So we talked about the assembly me mechanisms and we said that, so let's label this as step number one the assembly of the proteins, and we said we need, we talked about the, okay, so the first thing was we said was the RPA and the XPA binds, all right, that was our first step, all right, so RPA and XPA, this is our step one, they both bind, and then our second step, um, Actually, this is the first step, and this is our second step, step one and step two. And I guess we can look at that, or, yeah. And then the third step is gonna be this. So once the, hold on, did I, yeah, XPF, oh, hold on, I made a mistake. This is not XP, this is XPF, not XPA. I made a mistake over here. Um, this should say XPF. Okay, there we go. Now it's correct. Uh, all right. So the third, uh, third in the third step. So once this XPF, okay, and this ERCC1, uh, they bind to XPA position. Then the RPA will end up recruiting this XPG. Okay. So after these two end up, we end up getting this uh, complex that forms. Then we end up getting XPG that ends up uh, being pulled over here to to this to the, close to the three prime end. All right, so that's the job for that. Now, so XPF, let's, let's call this the XPF complex. Okay, we'll end up recruiting the XPG protein to its position. So then it can start cleaving in its direction. Now, the fourth step is for the fourth step, we have XPG, okay? So 
x p g it's going to end up cleaving towards that three prime end okay x p g cleaves towards the three prime end all right and the x p f and the x p f the the ERCC1, actually it's ERCC1, okay? Uh, that ends up cleaving towards the, the five prime bend, okay? So that's, this is the fourth step. So that's essentially the, the, we already, I showed you this over here in the drawing. And then <clears throat> in the fifth step, essentially we have is that in the fifth step, we end up having the replication machinery, which ends up being recruited. Okay, recruitment of replication machinery. All right. So, um, and again, this gets done at the, the three prime OH. Okay. All right. So this essentially is this third step in the, the nucleotide excision repair. Now we'll go, we're going to move on to the next steps. All right, so for the last step, essentially, so remember, what ended up happening in this part over here is that the uh, XPG minute up came in and it cleaved towards the three prime end and the ERCC1 ended up cleaving towards the, the, the five prime end, okay? So remember, so when ERCC1, when this protein ended up making its cleave towards the five prime end, right? So here's our five prime end over here. What did it do? It ended up exposing this three prime OH. And then remember, we said that once we have this XPF complex that forms, then that ends up recruiting the XPG. And then at that point, the XPG will make the cut towards the three prime end. Now that we've done that, we've, in other words, we have an excision, okay? We have, in other words, we have a dual excision that's been uh, that's been made. So once the dual excision is made, the at that point the replication machinery uh, ends up being recruited at the three prime hydroxyl end at this part, and then we start to build. So who, what are the players for this? All right. So to answer that, the last step is the the uh, the repair synthesis. So for the repair synthesis, this is our final step. Repair synthesis. Right. So what happens in repair synthesis? Who are the players that are involved over here? So in repair synthesis, we have essentially this. We have DNA, okay, polymerase, delta, DNA polymerase delta, and uh, we also have, we have another one, we have DNA polymerase epsilon, okay, DNA polymerase, Epsilon. All right, so now in order for D DNA polymerase delta to work, it needs, it requires another protein. It, and this protein is PCNA, and it needs one more, okay? The other one is um, replication factor C, okay? Replication factor C. So these are the two uh, proteins that are required, all right, in order for DNA polymerase delta to work. Now. Uh, DNA polymerase epsilon, it needs, it also needs a protein, and it needs one that's called CTF, CTF8, okay? So once polymerase comes in, then it's going to end up, remember, it's going to end up uh, synthesizing, it's going to end up uh, the, the, the bases that, that are needed, it'll go, go along. Uh, once it's added the bases, added all the bases, then what, what do we end up having here? Let me draw that out. So imagine here, this is our bubble. Okay, so again, we have um, the five prime end here, three prime end here, three, mm, yeah, five to three. And this will be five over here and a three prime over here. Okay, so there we go. So essentially, Polymerase is going to come and build the part over here, all right? And I'm just going to change the color just to, for the sake of showing you. All right, so imagine polymerase comes and adds this on, adds these parts on, okay? 
So once polymerase does that, uh, it adds the bases on, then we still have a small nick that's present, right? So the nick ends up being, being fixed by, if you guys remember, another protein, which is called, this is the last part, we end up having DNA ligase, ligase 3, okay? Ligase 3 alpha, okay? So DNA ligase 3 alpha will end up sealing the, the NICs, right? So it ends up coming and here. We'll seal this part and this part. Now everything is perfect. And this is essentially it. This is nucleotide excision repair. So remember, four steps that are involved. Here's our first step over here, damage recognition. What's the next part? Opening, uh, DNA opening and the damage verification. So I'm sorry, the first part is DNA damage recognition. That's number one, DNA damage recognition. Next part we said is DNA opening and damage verification. Third part we said is the assembly of the pre-excision complex, okay? And then finally the last is the repair synthesis, all right? So these are the four steps that are involved and we went to details of each one. All right, so that's it. So for the SOS repair, all right, keep in mind that this happens when we have a lot of damage, when we have extensive or we have very bad, um, very bad damage. Okay, let's just say this very bad or extensive damage. Okay, um, extensive, S-I-V-E, extensive damage. All right, so now, it's part of this, the DNA repair system, okay? This is an emergency in DNA damage, right? So that's what you wanna remember, right? So this is gonna happen, so it's part of the DNA, it's part of the DNA repair, uh, DNA repair systems. And uh, remember, this happens in emergency when we have lots extensive damage. So this SOS response This SOS response, uh, it's going to synthesize DNA repair enzymes, okay? That's one thing, synthesizes DNA repair enzymes. And SOS response also um, in its, um, so again, it's initiated at, so initiation, it's initiation is due to severe D, severe, let's put this down, severe DNA damage by UV light, by UV radiation. All right, so um, what ends up happening is that we end up getting these, uh, this is this operon, the operon for the SOS gene Right, our run for SOS gene. Uh, it's regulated by two G proteins. Right, so when we end up having this severe, this extensive DNA damage, okay, by ultraviolet radiation, uh, the operon again for the SOS gene gets regulated by two genes, and this is what we're going to be looking at uh, in a little bit of detail. So these two proteins that regulate it, right, they're G proteins. They are. Lex A and the other one is Rec A. Okay, so Lex A and Rec A. These are the two proteins that um, are. These are the two. Yeah, these are the two proteins that are going to be playing. Or the uh, now to understand this. Uh, Lex A is a repressor, okay? So this is a repressor. Lex A is a repressor of the SOS operon. So in other words, it's gonna end up inhibiting the SOS gene from expressing, okay? So it inhibits SOS gene. Whereas the Rec A gene, this is an inducer, okay? So this is an inducer.
So this is going to be the inducer for the SOS operon, for the SOS gene. All right? And in other words, it leads to the expression of the SOS gene. All right? So now let's take a look at how this all comes together. Before we move on to that, let's just have a very quick recap of uh, why this is used in the first place. All right, so we're going to be going over the SOS response now. So what are we looking at over here is, again, we have DNA, we have the red, the, the red line that's going from the 3' prime to the 5' prime direction, and then we have the, the blue strand that's going from the 5' to the 3' prime direction. Now, what's going to end up happening, for example, is we end up having light damage, okay? UV light damage. So the UV light damage comes in, all right? Uh, and what ends up happening now is now we have damaged DNA. Okay, now we got damaged DNA. This is the first thing that happens after the ultraviolet light exposure. Next is that this uh, damaged DNA, what ends up happening most of the time is we end up getting these thymine dimers that form, okay? Thymine dimers, all right? This is what forms. So what these thymine dimers do is they, re they lead to these, uh, the replication fork stallings, right? So here, let's say first thing is we have the damage, the damaged DNA. Second thing that, we, that uh, the problem that happens is we end up getting the fork stalling, okay, replication. Fork stalling. Let me do this. Um, Okay, so we have the replication fork stalling. The next thing is once we have these dimers that form and then we end up having the fork stalling, we have the photoreactivation mechanism that kicked in, that kicks in. Okay, so this is the photoreactivation. photoreactivation okay photoreactivation mechanism this is this is a dna repair mechanism and what this does is um, with the help of these photolyzed enzyme it removes the thymine dimers okay so we end up having um, in photoreactivation we have uh, they're called photolyse again photolysis and these are enzymes, okay? So they end up removing the thymine dimers, right? So then what ends up happening is then uh, these, for these enzymes, they end up essentially, once they remove the dimers, you end up getting, again, it, rep it um, repairs the damaged DNA. Okay, repairs damaged DNA. All right, this is wonderful, this is great, all right? So essentially one, two, three, and then what do we have? Again, after essentially four steps, uh, or again, three steps, we end up having the DNA that gets uh, repaired. Now this works well for when there's a little bit damage and there's small scale damage. However, when you have too much damage, okay, we have excessive DNA damage. This leads to multiple fork stallings. And this pathway over here will not work. Okay, this doesn't work well for multiple fork stallings. So this is when we end up getting, what do we call this? We call this the, um, the SOS response, all right? Now we end up having the SOS response that kicks in, okay? When we have too much damage, extensive DNA damage. And this essentially goes through two ways, all right? This will go through either the nucleotide excision repair, or we end up having the DNA translation okay. synthesis, All right? And which with DNA translation synthesis eventually will end up leading to, may lead to DNA, the formation of DNA uh, polymerase five. Okay. So this is what we're going to be looking at over here. So essentially what ends up happening is this. Um, 
again, when we end up having multiple forks that form, all right, at, at that point, when we're talking about large scale extensive damage, all of this doesn't work anymore. This is not gonna help it. So you go through this part, all right? This, after this part, then we come over here, all right? So we don't go to the, the, the remainder of these steps, all right? This is, remember, this is for extensive DNA damage, large scale damage. All right, so let's continue with how this pathway works. All right, so this SOS operon, it consists of a promoter, okay, uh, promoter genes, operator genes, and then it has the, the, the structural genes, all right? So what's gonna happen is, the first thing that ends up happening is that we end up getting, um, okay, so let's just take number one for example. We're gonna, we're gonna end up getting RNA polymerase, okay? Polymerase will come in and it'll bind to the promoter site, okay, to, to start to transcribe the R, uh, mRNA gene. All right, so here's our promoter region over here, right? This is our promoter region. And let's just draw out, um, here, we'll just use this color, to draw the, here, the um, polymerase, RNA polymerase, right? So let's say it comes in, right? There we go. So this is RNA polymerase, okay? So this is what it's gonna do. It's gonna come and it's gonna bind. Now it's ready to make, it's ready to transcribe. However, what we end up happening is at the operator site, right? At the operator site, we have a, we have a protein over here, all right? And I'm going to use, yeah, let me use a, yeah, that's fine. Now over here, this is the operator site. And over at the operator site, we're gonna end up having, perfect. We're gonna have this other protein that's over here, okay? And this is the Lex A, all right? So Lex A, Remember, this is Lex A over here. And Lex A, it's bound to this operator site. And it's not going to allow the polymerase to start moving. It's not going to allow it to start reading. Okay, so it, it, it inhibits the, um, uh, the initiation of transcription, right? So remember, polymerase wants to go over here. It wants to start reading. However, this guy is... Lex A, it's stopping it. It won't let it allow it to move forward so it can go and read. So um, what, what, what do we do now? What's the problem? So this is, it's not a problem at this point, but again, what this is saying is that, remember, what, what did we say? Lex A, it's an inhibitory protein. So in order for, um, for Lex A to be removed, something needs to happen. Uh, so again, when there is DNA damage, when there's a lot of DNA damage, the REC A protein will get activated, okay? So now let's go to step two. So step two, um, so here, let me do this, let me say this. In the second step, when there's a lot of DNA damage, not second step or third step, but again, remember, this is going to be normal. In other words, we have the polymerase, uh, RNA polymerase that attaches uh, to the promoter region, and then it gets stopped by Lexi. What does this mean? It means that we don't have too much damage, right? So this process does not need to go forward, okay? Now, if there is a lot of damage, a lot of UV damage, then the Rec A protein gets activated. And then Rec A, the Rec A protein, it initiates autocatalytic, um, autocatalytic cleavage of that Lex A from this operator site, okay? So Rec A then will come over here and essentially it ends up removing that. See, this is what Rex A will do. So Rex A, essentially, Rec A will end up cleaving that, so Rec A, just remove that the, it cleaved, it cut off the Lex A, okay? That's what would happen when we have lots of DNA damage, 
extensive DNA that damage. So let's uh, let's go over there. So remember, extensive DNA damage will um, lead to Rec A activation. Okay. Okay. So. Uh, and then once the rat, uh, the rat A is activated, it's going to go end up cleaving the Lex A. As you can see at the operator region, it's free now. We don't have this Lex A protein there anymore. Okay. So when that happens, now polymerase, now polymerase is able to, um, now it can go and start reading. Okay. You can start the transcription um, process. So polymerase, let's go over here then. Let's go down over here. So in, in the third step, what's going to end up happening is polymerase then. RNA polymerase. Then we'll begin transcription. Okay, it's going to start transcription uh, for the SOS gene. So what do we end up getting at that point again? You know, so you go from the DNA, and this is what we have, right? The DNA over here. This is all DNA. From DNA transcription, we say it goes from uh, DNA to. This is just a bit of a review in case some some of you have forgotten or confused or never bothered studying uh, mRNA right and then from and then remember what we call this this is the transcription right so this is called transcription going from DNA to mRNA now once we have the mRNA now we need to make we need to start to read that mRNA and start to build protein. So when you go from mRNA to protein, this is the next step, right? Protein synthesis. And again, this is called translation. All right, so just in case you got for this is just a very quick, brief review uh, of that. All right, so this is what's, what, what is happening. This is what, this is, this is what we're gonna be doing over here. Uh, in other words, once the uh, this over here, polymerase starts to read the genes, all right? And again, these are the genes over here that we're talking about uh, that will be be read. This is what we're talking about. So now let's talk about these over here. All right, now what's going to end up happening is the very first part that it comes to, the very first polymerase will come and start to transcribe this, the, the UVRA, Uh, you, it's, I'm sorry, yeah, this is a, yeah, the UVRA um, gene. So UVRA gene, essentially what this will do is this. UVRA gene, when you transcribe it, this ends up coding for, this will end up giving you a another enzyme. So when you end up translating this, okay, so when you transcript, uh, translate, remember you go from, the polymerase will come, it's going to make mRNA, from the mRNA it's going to make the protein, and the protein that you get after translation of UVRA is a endonuclease. It, this is called UVRABC endonuclease. Okay, so UVRABC endonuclease. And, uh, you know, this is one of the, it's one of the chief enzymes for prokaryotes in this nucleotide excision repair in NER, all right? So now, hopefully this is enough, all right? Hopefully this is enough. Hopefully this step uh, is enough to fix the damage. However, however, if this pathway, in other words, going from, uh, you, with, with the help of UVR, ABC, right, endonuclease, uh, again, and then having the, doing the nucleotide excision repair, if this is not enough, then we end up going to the transcription, then we need UMUC and UMUD genes to be uh, transcribed and then tr uh, subsequently translated. So what this is going to do is this, both UMUC 
and UMUD. UMUC and UMUD, uh, they lead to the formation of, these two genes lead to the formation of polymerase, polymerase five, all right? So these two genes, they code for DNA polymerase five. And DNA polymerase five, it starts, again, translation of DNA synthesis. And again, this is just a survival pathway. So what it ends up, what ends up happening is um, polymerase five, it ends up bypassing these, the, uh, the lesions, right? It bypasses them, and then it, in doing so, it incorporates uh, the wrong nucleotides more frequently, and this is what leads to mutations. Okay, so, but and remember, this is, it's a survival pathway that this is taking, all right? Uh, so this essentially is it. This is this SOS pathway, right? With, with, the, with the operons that are involved. The SOS operon, the SOS gene, uh, which leads to the formation of, essentially we're looking at uh, UVRA, or again, if that is not sufficient, uh, to the, tr the translation of UMUC and UMUD genes, which then will subsequently give us a DNA polymerase 5. Okay, so that's, that's all.